Hi, Sheila. Hi, Micah. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing pretty well today. Excited to talk about kombucha mm -hmm. and open science. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, hope people can see my screen. I just wanted to, um, before we get started too deeply, to point out we have this um, GitHub repo where we're collecting all of our ideas, um, and we have a schedule of chats over the next couple of weeks. Um, today, kombucha and open knowledge. Next week, um, credit contributors and chai. And then our final week in February will be diversity, documentation, and Darjeeling, which will be really fun. Uh, so people can come here. We'll make sure there's a link. Um, oh, thank you to our moderator, who already has a link uh, in the chat there. Um, and all of our resources that we prepare for and then ones that we think of after are uh, ending up in this GitHub repo. So this will be a great um, place for people to look for things about what we talk about. Uh, any other? Do do we do announcements? Are we are we getting too official? Are we corporate, Sheila? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, uh, we could explain reproducibility again, or we could introduce ourselves too. We should probably do. That. Oh right, you you go first. <laughs> go ahead. I'm Sheila Saya. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at NC State in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering. And my research is on uh, water resources, um, including like how do we improve water quality and water quantity, uh, mostly in North Carolina, but I've worked in other places too. So yeah, I'll pass it to you. Thank you. And I that just reminded me of a question I had for you. But so I'm uh, Micah Vandergriff, the Open Knowledge Librarian at NC State Libraries. Um, most of what I do is work with uh, wonderful people like Sheila to think about how to translate uh, academic knowledge into the public sphere, whatever that looks like. Right now, it, it looks like Twitch, um, but this is this is great. Um, the oh, the did you see that news about the hacker in Florida who got into the water? I heard about that on NPR. I was listening to it this morning, and I was just like, oh. Should we should we back up? <laughs> I don't. What, Do you want to explain what happened? Uh, I, I'll t I'll say what I well oh yes yeah, so I saw that um, I don't know how water is managed like through you know uh, maybe you can maybe you know more but um, somehow a hacker was able to um, get into the filtration system or something of uh, somewhere in Florida uh, and. Um, change the levels in the water quality that was going out to people, to homes, right? Um, that made it kind of almost dangerous to, to drink, right? Is that, did I cover it? Yeah. Yeah. From what I heard, it was like they were using that software called Team Viewer, which a lot of people use for like, like say you have a computer on campus mm -hmm. and you're a researcher working from home now during the pandemic. You might use Team Viewer to like access your remote computer. It sounded like they got to this computer, which is like uh, for um in a in a water quality treatment facility, and like were able to add, I think, a pretty strong base mm. to the the water. Um, but they were saying that there are a lot of other checks along the way that the water has to go through, so. Uh, I think the person saw their mouse moving like, oh, wow. without them moving it, and that's how they knew. But yeah, I was definitely, yeah, I was really shocked about that. I'd heard people, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this, and I guess it is an open knowledge thing. I, I've heard that like some municipalities, for example, are very hesitant to provide like locations for different water resources um, for these types of, because of these types of issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because we, it's such an important utility for us, like a resource for us. Yeah. And so I, yeah, I think that was like an example of like a cyber security issue. Yeah, there's so many, so many directions we could go with that one. Uh, I, I want to say hi to Roxana and Woodsend, who are joining us again this week. Uh, thanks, y'all, for being here. Uh, looks like Roxana uh, said that maybe this is near Oldsmar. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, oh, there's the NPR article from our moderator. Thank you, Claire. Yes, okay. strange 
scary stuff, but your um, question about there's probably an open or you know a public knowledge angle here that we could take. I think is is right on. Before we get to that, can, let's talk about kombucha. So oh, yeah, um, of course. I I I have to admit this is like I have to confess I don't like kombucha. Am I? Am we? Are we still good? Yeah, that's fine. I totally <laughs> get that. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> so, yeah, the um, I I've tried it a couple different times. Have friends that have made it for us. Um, the one that I've found that I like is something you can buy at Whole Foods or somewhere where it's like um, carbonated and lightly mm -hmm. kombuchaed. You know. Yeah. Um, that's the one that I'm like pretty okay with. But uh, t t let's let's see it. Can we see oh, it? Oh yeah. Do you want to see it? Hold on. I have to get up. And bring sure. It over. All right. So this is my kombucha. So um, I actually just brewed it uh, like this past weekend, and so you can see like floating on the top. Um, this is actually so. It's called a SCOBY, which is an acronym. It stands for synthetic, or sorry, not synthetic, uh, symbiotic <laughs> community of bacteria and yeast. <laughs> and so what happens, I have a little quote, which when I put this down, I'll read it. But basically, this is like a bacterial mat um, that the bacteria and the yeast live together and they produce cellulose as a byproduct of what's ever going on in here and that creates this like floating thing um and then typically in a healthy uh scoby for kombucha you'll also see these things hanging down <laughs> and those are actually like yeast colonies and so that's what actually gives the ye the drink that like fizziness because they will take up um the sugar and create like carbon dioxide. They'll also create alcohol, but then other bacteria um, in the community will eat the alcohol and create vinegar. So maybe it's definitely an acquired taste because kombucha is typically kind of vinegary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's like sort of surprising if you're, you know, expecting to drink like juice and it's like sour. So, um, but yeah, that's mine. And then basically what you do is you make like a sweet tea and then you just add in a little, like if you've used a sourdough starter, like every time you take a little piece of the, or, you know, like a little amount of the starter and then you add more flour and water, mm -hmm. it's the same thing with this. You take like some of the liquid from the previous one and then use that um, in a new one. And so, and then you just keep the, a thing that's floating on the top. So I also said I would uh, share what flavored ones that I made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have two. One I made a while back that I haven't drank yet. And then the other I just made this weekend. So um, here, I'll show both of them. So they're actually in old kombucha <laughs> bottles. So, <laughs> um, but this lighter one is like an apple ginger mm. kombucha. And then this one, um, I get a CSA here in Durham, and they had uh, lemongrass that we could get. So I boiled the lemongrass in like a juice. And so it's like pomegranate, lemongrass, ginger. And I always try to put ginger in because I love ginger kombucha. See, so what? When you describe the flavors, ginger is my favorite. Yeah, the flavors sound really good. I I like that those combos of flavors sound like things that I would want to drink. So I think it is like the the vinegariness that's always sort of like, uh, do I really want to drink the rest of this? You know, um, that's awesome though. Yeah, sometimes like the bottom, I could also see like because there is like little sediment that forms on the bottom, and sometimes. Like, I think on the one, the apple ginger one, I'm not sure if you could see it, but there was like a little scoby that started forming huh. on the top. 
And like when you drink that, it's kind of like an oyster. Like, <laughs> I was going to ask if it but, is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, no offense to oysters, but it has a similar <laughs> like texture <laughs> as the oysters. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No offense to them, but um, it has a similar like sliminess uh, or like you know like smooth. So it's like pretty surprising if you're just drinking liquid and then that. Yeah, yeah. You get that little like piece. Oh, okay, I have so many questions, and um, okay, I'll start with this one. H how did you? Uh, I was in a conference a couple of days ago um, about open science in the education field, and they started one of the things um, by saying, "What's your open science origin story?" Which I think is a really cool way to kind of introduce one another, you know, especially coming from different disciplines. But what I want to know is what's your kombucha or origin story? Is this like, did you get interested because of food ways or, you know, um, uh, or is it more a, a, like on your science side or did both of those just come together in this drink that you happen to make? I think it's both for me. So when I was working on my PhD, I did a lot of like I learned a lot about like microbial processes in the environment. And I, I think that's sort of when I started thinking more about like other microbial processes that happen like in everyday, uh, you know, in our everyday lives. And so um, like sourdough, like I have a sourdough starter mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like I started kombucha and I think it was, I'd always kind of wanted to try it like, at first, I didn't actually like the taste of kombucha. I remember the first time. But I think that I had, like, a, a better experience. Maybe I I really like the GT kombucha. Um, they have – and there is actually a really good local brand called Triangle Kombucha. It's, like, something – Tribucha, I think it's called, which is I, like I've had that. Yeah, made yeah. in the triangle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that one, they have this one that's like sage and rosemary and it's like very good. And so I guess I was also drawn to like the culinary aspect of it because you can really make any flavor you want. And I think there's actually, um, Claire, if you wouldn't mind dropping, there's this book I added to the resource page called The Big Book a big book of kombucha and in there mm -hmm. the authors outline like all these different flavor combinations you can make and some of them I think are kind of like I would never try like I remember they were one of them was like something with bacon and like I was just like <laughs> no 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 um, <laughs> but like yeah you could use anything that has like natural cool. sugar in it and and so to explain it a little bit more, which I kind of skipped this step, but so in the big jar that I had, that's like the first, like the primary fermentation. Um, and so because it's like open to the atmosphere, it'll get a little fizzy, but it won't get like that fizzy as the ones you buy like in the store. Mm -hmm. To get it more fizzy, you actually have to like cap it. You, you add a little sugar and then you cap it. And that's what makes it like carbonated. So that's the secondary fermentation where you actually are capping it. And hmm. those are like the smaller containers. That they use. So there's a lot of like, if you're interested in like other fermentation, like drinks, you know, like especially beer, cause it's carbonated. It's pretty similar. Like the process of making it is pretty similar to that. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at this now. So our, our, our viewers slash listeners should be able to see it also. Um, what, so like the SCOBY, I, I've heard it called a mother. Is that, am I yeah. like in the same? Yeah. Okay. W why that? Do you know? <laughs> I actually don't know. <laughs> but my guess is that it's like, it's kind of like where all the bacteria are. Like, it's like a, like a nurturing uh, part of the, Sure. And then like that produces other things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's um, take, let's take a moment. I, I know you added the fermentology um, as a resource also. Do, could you take a moment to plug that series? Yeah. So I'm not directly involved. Well, 
I'm not directly involved in this, but I, so um, Dr. Robert Dunn at NC State and his awesome team, um, they, they have quite a few like microbial ecology product, uh, projects that look at different foods and um, other things that we eat that rely on like fermentation processes. Mm -hmm. And I think this seminar is a really fun way to like learn more about uh, those processes. And it's put on through the applied ecology department at NC State. And one of the cooler, one of like, I mean, Rob Dunn has like so many cool <laughs> projects, but one of the coolest projects um, that his group was working on is this sourdough project mm -hmm. where they, they sequenced like sourdough from people that would just send in their sourdough. And actually I sent in my sourdough and got like the sequence results back through that. So, and then they recently published a paper on it. But I know one of their collaborators, Dr. Benjamin Wolf, who actually, he's the, the link that I shared with you before with that like microscope slide. Yeah, yeah. I think he's also interested in like studying kombucha microbiology. So. Um, yeah, this is awesome. Oh, yeah, I would definitely, those guys are doing some cool stuff. Um, and yeah, and the team there, um, just looking at like how kombucha or sourdough uh, microbial communities change o over like space and in time, things like that. It's mm -hmm. we, I mean, they work, but we still don't know like that much about I mean, we know like generally about them, like what bacteria are in them, but we we still don't know that much about about them and how they function, how they change. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, another um, thing that I've enjoyed about the fermentology series is that um, it's not like love science i'm here for science but it's not just science right they have historians in they have uh, food people cooks and chefs you know so they've really taken a broad spectrum they're thinking about um how uh f fermentation interacts with us in our lives right yeah science history um eating etc yeah. yeah cool um what else do you want to say about kombucha? And then I do want to. I, I want. I figured we could we could visit Oxford today. We haven't been there yet, but there are. Yeah. But what what else do you want to say about kombucha? You want me to show this picture? Yeah, it's just cool because you can see the different oh, I think organisms. That's mine. Where's yours? Here it is. That there. Um. Bacteria it, cells, yeast cells. Yeah, that one. There we go. That's the one. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So so it's you know it doesn't so that like mat that i showed you it doesn't look very like stable but i've actually tried like very with a lot a lot of effort to actually like cut mine with like a very sharp <laughs> knife and it's quite hard so it's it's definitely like a very strong like cellulose material that these bacteria are creating um and yeah, you can see like they're in, interacting in that image, like the bacteria and the yeast. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually one paragraph in that post that Claire, thank you so much for linking to that. I think it gives a very good explainer of like what's going on and the overall process of like what's happening, what compounds are produced by who, <laughs> and stuff like that. So I'd recommend, and that, that blog post is by Benjamin Wolf. Cool. Uh, I did a, a, a little bit of research. I'll, I'll just click through these really quickly. But um, what was the interesting one I wanted to? Oh, yeah. Um, it's this one here. No, that's my preprint. OK, they took kombucha to space. Have you ever heard? Have you heard of this? No. I found this article <laughs> from the Journal of Astrobiology uh, from when was this? 2019 about oh almost almost a year almost two years ago exactly it was published online um multi-microbial oh. kombucha culture tolerates mars-like conditions simulated on low earth orbit um 
I haven't linked these yet in our um, GitHub, but I will because I was I was just doing a general search for kombucha and came across this um, astrobio. So like the Europeans are putting kombucha in space because why wouldn't they? Well, we know now that if you know if we land on Mars, then we can drink kombucha too. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta stay healthy. <laughs> Exactly. Cool. Okay, let's uh thanks. This is so awesome. I wanted to take a second to um uh I think we mentioned this last time, but we um this whole project was inspired by some of our friends and colleagues at the University of Oxford. We started this uh, journal club that they call Reproducibility, and there are, as you can see, clubs all around the world now, which is amazing. Uh, and so I thought it might be fun if we uh, visited Oxford, so I'm going to go ahead and um, transport us there. Are you ready, Sheila? I'm ready. Excited. So, thank I've you. I've never been to London. Yeah. <laughs> You've never been in the UK at all? Uh-uh. Ah. Maybe the airport, I guess. Okay. That's about okay. it. <laughs> Well, I don't know if that counts. Yeah, here we are. Thanks to the Oxford Internet Institute, they have a live webcam um, that I happened to come across when uh, looking at some of the reproducibility stuff. And so, um, I think for the next little while, we can just let's chat about uh, open knowledge and work through some of our questions. But we'll be uh, in our, um, you know, in Oxford, just enjoying the the street view there as the sun goes down. Sound good? Oh, that sounds great. Okay, let me, we, um, the related topic that we wanted to cover today was what, uh, it's like half of my job title, right? Open knowledge. Um, we've danced around it a lot, I think, al already. Um, and when we were prepping, one of the um, things that I mentioned to you was this sort of typology in information science that we talk about um, data to information to knowledge, right? It's kind of like a, an upwards thing. And then um, more so lately, I've been hearing pop t people talk about wisdom, like when does something go from knowledge to wisdom up that chain? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question that I wanted to start with is, in your opinion, or, you know, we can, um, we can discuss, but how do we know when something moves from information to knowledge or like what even is information? We talk about we're in the information age. I describe myself as an information scientist. What does that mean? How does something move from information to knowledge? What do you think? Yeah, when I was thinking a little bit about this question because I saw you had posted it. Um, I feel like a lot of my thoughts around like knowledge and learning come from like what I know from just like teaching hmm. and or like pedagogy in general and I was I think the first thing that came to my mind is that like Bloom's taxonomy that sure sure uh, a lot of people will use to think about um you know like how people acquire knowledge and then um, move up the ladder with that knowledge and, and the ladder here being like you know first maybe you learn a fact and then you're able to like say that fact back to somebody that's like the first step and then you sort of move on and you see like okay well I know this fact but now I can actually apply it to maybe some more general thing. Mm -hmm. And then you start to say like, okay, I'm applying it to this general thing. And I'm actually, then I start to like generate new information and like cause other people to question things. So I think the generating the new information, I feel like that whole, uh, that whole like, process is definitely knowledge um and that there's different like types of knowledge right mm -hmm. and I can't remember the first part of your question <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm just I think just yeah, stumbling just like, through it yeah like trying to figure out um it, but okay I want to pick up on something you just said is there are different types of knowledge and so um in in my world in in, in libraries information science 
really in like the last year, um, our, our field has started to come to to grips to I- admit and be more clear about um, we've sort of prized um, a particular kind of knowledge in society for a long time to the um, to the denigration of many other kinds of knowledge, right? So this is like previewing where we could go with our diversity talk later uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so I think there's a there's a lab in Canada, a re- recently launched lab uh, uh, from a guy named Leslie Chan, and he la- uh, the lab is called the Knowledge Equity Lab. Uh, and they just announced they're re- releasing a podcast. I think it starts in a couple of weeks, and I'm super excited to hear because um, everything Leslie does is great. Um, but I assume that some of what they're going to deal with is some of these questions that we're asking, like what um, – the, yeah, so you, you said that whole process is the, a process of building knowledge. I, I agree with you there. Um, so when we add, like, when information connects to each other, right, then we can start to say, oh, okay, there's there's something else happening here. Um, I've contextualized yeah. this. I um, understand. I'm making connections with um, something I knew before and something I know now. Um, I want to ask the big question. So, like, how... If uh, if that's the the frame that we've been existing in, you and I both r- raised in you know in America. Yeah, you grew up in America. Yeah, yeah raised in America. Um, now working uh, in higher ed and kind of spent a lot of our recent years in higher ed. Um, what are we missing, right? What what knowledge isn't accounted for, uh, and what do we do about that? Fermentology, I think, is a great example of that. Um, understanding of health and food ways is a, a, a another um, a great example of that. I'll just stop. <laughs> I could keep asking questions, but it's a big, big yeah. idea. Yeah, I think maybe like it's, well, just, I'm just like, you know, this thought just came to my mind, but uh, like maybe I think of open science as like, or open research or you know, open humanities to, you know, like that is referring to almost like the end product in a way, whereas like the open knowledge is like the information that you need to like get to that Hmm. product or end goal. And so I think, um, I mean, there's a lot of information that you would need to like find and that can actually be quite overwhelming to people that I think are interested in like for example doing open science but don't really know where to start Mm -hmm. and I think yeah maybe that's where like the knowledge piece comes in it's like knowing where to go to get more information or to like uh and this is information like regarding how to do open science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Could we? Um, is it too far out of bounds to discuss the article that we're working on a little bit? The ten simple oh, rules. Oh, uh, yeah, we can talk about it. Yeah. So, um, I think it's a good example because one, one. Th- so there, um, Sheila and some of her colleagues are writing an article called Temp- Ten Simple Rules for um, Researchers Who Develop Web Apps," right? Yeah, yeah, um, and they've they've invited me to, to contribute, and um, one of the things that I picked up on, kind of re- reading through, is that it's not just about technical knowledge, right? That th- there is a way to develop web apps for research, and there's some technical yep. knowledge involved there, but um, to make that the 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 thing public, open, reusable, whatever. You need to be able to know how to talk to the Office of Information Technology. You need to um, know where to find, if you, there's a piece of this development, um, the framework that you can't do, where do you find the people? Like, what are the connections you need to make to get to the people who um, who couldn't help contribute to that project? Um, so, yeah, I think that that's a really good example of... Um, I don't know. There is a word for it, and I, I just don't know it. But like the the social knowledge that exists in a place mm-hmm. like a university, um, and how um, 
in order to be effective or um, successful in universities, there's a lot more you need to know than just how to how to program well or how to um, uh, study literature well or how to um, do field work as an archaeologist, right? Yep. Yeah, and and I think like yeah, just yeah, like knowing for in our case, like when we were working on developing this web application, like just even knowing that there like at NC State, for example, there is like a whole office that is focused on aiding researchers who are interested in like these types of web apps <laughs> and like would like to develop them and like how to make sure that they're accessible to to all and like, you know, that the researcher um has included things in, for example, like if they are trying to hire a web developer to help them outside of the university, like the things that they have to think about when they're doing that and hmm. like include in the request for a proposal. So like all that, like, like just navigating like that and also just knowing about um, like who to help or who to get help from Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. yeah so and I think that's also true like I find that to be true in terms of like doing open science it's like I'm yeah. very grateful for people like you and like I've, I've had like awesome mentor awesome other awesome library mentors <laughs> like along the way that I've like you know really relied on and like they're happy to help me like navigate the resources that are available because I just don't even know where to start. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if, so one, one of our questions we wanted to get to is um, what are our open knowledge roles, right? So myself as a librarian, you as a researcher, um, I'd love to, I, I, I'll take a first pass at it, but I'd love to hear you talk about um yeah, sh Shellcast, and, and thanks again, Claire, for getting that. Um, we found a news story about you, Sheila. Um, oh, yay! <laughs> yeah, um, and and talk about like what Shellcast does. That for you is a representation of uh, open knowledge. Um, for me, it's kind of like in how I described myself. Wh what I'm interested in is connecting with anyone on campus, really, and thinking about. Um, so this like plays into our, our, our definition of open knowledge as co connecting ideas, right? Connecting information. How can, how can we connect, uh, who have I been working on? Oh, like, um, I, I've, um, there's a, a researcher, I forget what department she's in, but who studies, um, coastal resilience, right? And, um, and Aaron, Aaron Seekamp is her name and how we, um, what do we have to do for cultural heritage sites, especially in North Carolina, that are on the coast that because of climate change, like the coast is coming this way and there's a lighthouse mm -hmm. right here. What are we going to do about that thing, right? Um, so um, Aaron is a cool example. I'll, I'll pull up uh, or in a second. She wrote a piece for The Conversation, which is a a site that allows research, invites researchers to um, – write about their work in, in plain language, and then it can be repurposed by news people around the world. Yeah, Erin Seekamp, thank you. Um, she's a great example. She, she didn't really need me, right, to, to, to do open knowledge, right? She's doing research and publishing and getting grants and also communicating her own work to the public through something like the conversation. Um, that is super cool, and I love uh, finding people like that. Um, so I, I'm excited to insert myself where I can be helpful and make some of those connections. Or if someone's never heard of the conversation or doesn't know how to share their data or like our library is deeply invested in working with people to build visualizations, right? Like if, if there's a, an aspect of your work that would be really, um, well conceptualized as a visualization, that's, we want to work with you to do that. And that becomes, in, in my opinion, a form of open knowledge or public knowledge. So that's how I see it um, working in, in my day-to-day -day work. Um, what about you? 
yeah, I think for me, it's, um, I, I see it as, you know, I am a researcher who, uh, my research is funded through um, public agencies that are taxpayer funded. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a researcher, I want to ensure that my work is reproducible and understandable to other researchers, but also that it's transparent to the general public who yeah. has supported my work. And so I see it kind of um, as important for those two things. And I think um, for me, it's just like every day I try to think about like, how can I be more open? And I, I, I know you are working on some writing projects and <laughs> there was like a quote that you had, Micah, um, that I wanted to read is just like open <laughs> science is a spectrum rather than an on or off switch and I definitely feel feel that like it's it's not like I think people shouldn't be like hard on themselves they should they should be kind to themselves and try to take open science in baby steps mm -hmm. and that each mm -hmm. project is like an iteration um we can't all just like, you know, it just, it's like impossible to know everything, like, for, like, if you're, if you have like a project that's not open, and then you're trying the next project, it's not gonna like, be very easy to have like every aspect of it open, you yeah. sort of have to like, start chipping away at something. So maybe this next project you're gonna work on, like, having the publication open. And then the next one, it's like the publication and the data set. And then the next one, it's like, okay, we're actually going to post the proposal on hmm. like a pre-registration site. So it's like, for me, it's like, I keep trying every project to like make my work more open. And like, as I do that, you learn, you just learn things about like how to do it and how it works for you, what platforms are most helpful um, and other resources. And then I think it also helps, you know, like for example, the OpenScapes project. Mm -hmm. That we that we love to also, talk about. <laughs> yeah, it's also helpful to like, you know, if you see things in your field that are, you know, starting to bubble up around like open science or open knowledge, like it's easier to once you have like an interest in that it's easier to like get something out of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i'm gonna i'm gonna tie it back to kombucha here for a second so like um you use the word community like in the in the like the stuff right the the sludge um would you say that um something becomes knowledge when it is engaged in a community. I think for open science, that is like the key hmm. aspect. Hmm. Um, because, I mean, a lot of, you know, at least, but it kind of like resonates with those two, you know, like um, to share with our researchers and to share with the general public. Yeah, yeah. I do think that like, uh, like I could just hold all this knowledge about open science, like, in, <laughs> but like, I think that the thing that is like draws me to open science is that it's a community effort mm -hmm. and that like people are working together and like learning from each other and considering different perspectives and different ways of approaching things. And I know like sometimes that can be a little bit messy to like, you know, have an end result. But I do think that like, that's what makes open initiatives like stronger and also 
like I mean, just look at like our like the R community. Yeah, yeah. Like a very good example. Or like the Python community are like very good examples of, you know, by making a software program open to everyone, like you like I can literally be like, I wonder if someone has done this type of analysis and then like Google that. Yeah. And then like sure enough someone has created like an R package to do exactly what I wanted to do and like I can benefit from that hmm. so it's I, it's definitely like a community led like that is very key I think to open yeah I, I totally agree and um the uh, I think okay I think I mentioned this last week where I I've always sort of worked in um two dis- different spheres like what I call open science now and then what I has been called digital humanities. So I'm always thinking of if I'm the open knowledge librarian, what's the, what's the thing in the middle where I can talk to different disciplines, but we can all sort of say, Oh yeah, that's, that's the thing that we're aiming toward. Um, open knowledge has been helpful um, rather than using the phrase open science right here in the U S especially talking, introducing myself as an open knowledge librarian has been a helpful way to say, um, like a, 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 a humanist who's interested in um, inviting a uh, public participation in their, um, the, their study or, or whatever, um, or, you know, giving a talk at a local library or working with a museum curator at, over at the Gregg Museum to, you know, uh, to put, it, put up a new show. Um, those for me are all also examples of um, open knowledge from, from a different discipline or a different uh, disciplinary mm-hmm. approach. So I, I, I like the concept of open knowledge because it feels a little bigger and more inclusive, especially in the U.S. Um, I, you know, I've never asked you this, but I'd love to um, hear more about the Our Ladies uh, work that you do. Um, you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times and I, I really know no detail about like what, what's that community coordination work like? What, uh, what's it like? Yeah. So our ladies is a, a global, uh, nonprofit organization that supports women and, um, other minority genders in our community. And so that's, like supports is kind of a, a general word, but we offer, you know, like workshops, training, support, um, like general support, camaraderie, um, community you know, help. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a community, and so like it's been really fun to be a part of that. And actually, we have so in the Raleigh Durham area, we have a local chapter of that, and so we put on. I mean, now everything is virtual, mm-hmm. but we have events and yeah, it's, it's to help, um, you know, those groups of people find community within our community and, uh, which has tended to be dominated by, um, you know, white men. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's been really fun. I think organizing wise. So I'm, I'm like, I literally just help put people into the directory, which is on the website. So <laughs> I'm, I'm like lower on the <laughs> leadership <laughs> rank, but it is fun, like helping organize like the local chapter, um, just because I meet other people in this area that are using R. And I think one cool thing, and I think this is true for the Python community too, is like, it's cool to see all the different disciplines that are brought together by these programming languages yeah yeah yeah. yeah, like you have people like me doing like environmental science type work but then there's you know like a lot of people in like the healthcare fields a lot of agriculture and life sciences people um even like you know other corporate uh organizations that have like lots of data, Hmm. like marketing data, you know, like all all these types of people um, that are like interested in like 
data analytics and things like that. So it's cool to like, like be in a very wide reaching community like that. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things that um, has been really inspiring to me. Um, so like libraries have sort of, uh, supported and talked about open for a long time. So I was in that world, like really, really library centric world for a long time. And then I went to this conference um, called OpenCon. Did you ever hear of OpenCon? Oh mm -hmm. man, it was amazing. Um, it ran, I think about five years. Um, but I, I went in uh, 2017, 16 or 17 in Berlin. And it was the first, and it, it was meant to be a global, interconnected, um, welcoming and open conference for anyone working in any of the open spaces, right? So open source, open data, open access. Um, what was the other one? I can't think. Oh, op open education. Um, oh, yeah. And okay. pulling all those people together. That was the first time ever in my career. Um, I was, you know, five or six years into my career there where I realized that... Um, I'm I'm like charging full steam ahead to try to like advocate for open from a library perspective, and then I met a um, a chemist from India who also was doing that, um, you know, advocating, uh, be, you know, sometimes being activists about it, gathering their own communities, building. Um, uh, resources like a directory of people who are interested in this stuff from all across yeah. the world so that was that's, um, awesome. that's the thing that has kept me interested I think in uh, the, the the big global open science movement is that yeah there's like anyone can find a hook in um, and I, I'm I'm trying hard um, here in the US to say let's not let that second word, open science, knowledge, scholarship, yeah. research. Let's not let that second word um, uh, be a, a reason not to participate, right? So I, I want historians to say, I believe in open science because it's about um, research being transparent. And that's something that I want to, or I believe in open science because it's about uh, democratization of knowledge, right? Which I think I would think that most people who work in universities would say that's why we're here <laughs> to like democratize knowledge, um, and we've sort of let some walls be built around that, but we're working to to break those down. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a book that I have often on my desk. Did I show you this the other week? I think so. Yeah. I've, I can't I can't not. I think about it all the time. Yeah, have Open knowledge places. institutions. Yeah, that was, uh, I had so many quotes I wanted to read today, but I think that'd be boring for anyone else. Anyway, um, the the authors of this book and like the, um, the kind of thesis behind it is questioning now again, you know, 20, I think they authored it in 2019, but it's about to be published by MIT Press. Um, what are universities for? They, they, we sort of understood what they were for in the pre-internet age, and they did that, maybe well, maybe not. Um, internet happened, and you know we've seen all these, uh, all this change, just social change, culture change, everything, right? So we need to ask the question again: What are universities for? And if we we come to an agreement that universities are for democratizing knowledge, so, uh, as they call it here, open knowledge institutions, um, there's probably some things we need to do differently <laughs> in the university to, to live up to that. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I could talk about this idea or that book for a long time, but I wanted to mention it because it's, it's, it's the reason that I, I wanted to have this, this discussion with you. Um, when we were first talking about the topic, you, you mentioned metadata. Where, where is the metadata connection to open knowledge? I think, um, I think where metadata fits in, it's like maybe one, it's like first like creating the what metadata and like the process of, of doing that, but then also like what information the metadata like 
um, presents so that others can like more deeply understand, for example, like in my case, like a research project or a data project mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. or product. And so I think, yeah, the metadata is like, I'm still thinking about like how I was defining open science and open knowledge and I think how you're defining it and I actually do like thinking about it as like that umbrella mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then maybe open science is like a little umbrella under the <laughs> umbrella um but I think that um yeah metadata is like one component of that and like developing it is also like also requires knowledge and I put some links yeah, that's what I was just so like. At. There's different formats of metadata by depending on your discipline. Mm -hmm. And there's all these standards that people have created to help people like in similar disciplines compare like metadata. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, thanks, Claire, for putting that in the chat. The reason I think it's it's interesting that you that like it is such a n n library nerdery, but we think about um, metadata all the time because it's what makes stuff discoverable, basically. Um, but we we started at the top talking about how um, maybe we could talk about knowledge as the connections between things. When I when I learn something and then I learn something else and I make that connection in in like the internet environment, metadata does that, right? It it. It, yeah. it more deeply describes a thing, whether that's a data set or a journal article or a, uh, or a mint awesome tea from, uh, nice. from, oh, what's the name of the coffee shop? Global Village. Global Village. I always want to say Common Grounds, which is a coffee oh. shop in Gainesville, Florida that I, or not a coffee shop, it was a, it was a club that I used to go to to watch shows, but I never even lived in Gainesville, but Common Grounds is always <laughs> the thing that I go to. Anyway. Global Village. We could have metadata about the awesome mint tea, right? That would then sort of deepen, and uh, the word we use in libraries is enrich the understanding of that object, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I like, um, I think it's a really interesting way to think about open knowledge as the, a, a big umbrella, but there's also like just a, like a, a thread underneath it that is the thing that connects different pieces of information and that um, in, you know, in, in technology or in, in science or um, in information science is metadata. I like thinking of metadata as like a connect connector. Yeah. Oh, if you, if you wanted to, I'm not going to do it because we don't have time, but if you wanted to do a crazy deep dive, um, I've been reading a bit about Wikidata lately. Do you know about Wikidata? Mm -hmm. Oh, don't you? I'm going to, I'm going to ruin your postdoc. Cause I'm just going to oh, keep sending, no. <laughs> Hey Sheila, you should know about Wikidata. Um, <laughs> Wikidata. Okay. I have a definition here is a free and open knowledge base that can be read and edited by both humans and machines. It's the structured data underneath all things wiki. So Wikimedia, Wikipedia, oh, okay. Wikivoyage, Wik Wiktionary, Wikisource. But, um, there's, as as knowledge is becoming deeper and broader. Ah, thanks, Roxana. Wikidata has a Twitter account. Oh man, I don't even want to know. Um, uh, so w w Wikidata scholarly knowledge is starting to be embedded in and with Wikidata, which um, you know how a DOI works or an ORCID ID, right? It's like a a, a pointer to me or a pointer to that article, right? Yep. Wikidata is trying to be the thing that is the pointer to the bit of knowledge, right? So like, I, 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 I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do the search. Kombucha, I'm sure, has a Wikidata entry. Yeah, there we go. And so it gives it a, a unique identifier that is Q657032. So then every bit of knowledge that ends up in the Wikipedia or, or sorry, in the wiki um, universe could be connected to this single oh. wiki data concept that is kombucha. So this is like 
meta metadata underneath much of the knowledge that the public not open knowledge that is on the web, which a lot of people will say is Wikipedia, right? Yeah. 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 There's oh, and there's this two. There's this tool called Scalia. I wish I, I should just be sure. I I need to start a Twitch account. I know. <laughs> okay, let me, we're gonna we're gonna. Really? Well, I let's mean, leave. It's nice to see Oxford. But... Let's leave. Okay, thanks, Oxford. <laughs> see you next time. All right, so we're looking at Scolia now. We might go over a couple minutes. I hope our listener viewers are okay with that. So Scolia is um, it creates these visual scholarly profiles for knowledge bits um, focused in um, in higher ed scholarship. So who should let's do um, who should we look up or or what? Give me a give me a topic. Let's see if we can find something. Well, we could look up Benjamin Wolf since we were talking about him before and his micro microbial ecology. I don't know if that's something you can look up. Uh, is that, did I spell it right? Benjamin W O L F E. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the second, maybe the second. Well, we should look at that bicycle racer, but let's see. <laughs> it looked like there was a researcher entry before you. Oh yeah, before I did it. Well, here's an orchid. Let's look at. So what Wikidata does is, is pulls together all those bits of information about um, Benjamin Wolf online. Let's see if this is the right Benjamin Wolf. Let me look at the, I don't know, maybe not, because the, the orchid is empty. But this is still cool. Not, yeah. not publishing huh, very that's much. Cool. Okay, wait, let's, we gotta find someone. You could look up Natalie. Oh yes, I I was gonna suggest that, but I didn't. <laughs> if she's not in here, I don't want to make her feel bad. <laughs> Natalie Nelson, researcher. Yes. Mm. This looks like Natalie, right? Yes. So we can get some publications per year. There are different ways you can view this data. Every time I try to change it, though, it it doesn't do what I want it to do, so I'm not going to mess with that. Um, Wikipedia pages about her. Here's some topics. Does Natalie study machine learning? Yep. Oh, right on. Biosensing, yes. So we have the right Natalie. Topics, so two. In this... Analogy. Yep. Wikidata, <laughs> Wikidata knows only what um, is connected through that universe, right? So I'm sure there's a lot more that, that could be here for, for Natalie. Yeah, algebra, algebra bloom, machine learning, topic works, yep. matrix. That looks like her. Yeah. Anyway. That's cool. Oh, the co-author graph. Yeah. Are you in here? Not yet. But mm -hmm. as like if uh, I can't think of any like huge, huge big name scientists that we could look for right now, but when there's someone that's been working for, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever, um, their co-author graph is just huge and like you can drag it around and find different people and it's mostly fun. Here's where some co-authors might be located. Yeah. Well, that's too. So it's almost like, you know, when you Google something and it like gives you like this little blurb at the top. Like a little snippet of like I don't know, like if you're you're looking like North Carolina State Parks or yeah. something. And it says like this year. is your probable what your yeah. 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 It's kinda of like that, but for like anything. Yeah, and, and cool. I think sometimes oft I, I don't know I this, but I would assume that sometimes those little knowledge bits at the top of a Google search can be fed by something like Wikidata. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Anyway, rabbit hole there, but I um, we we had to talk about metadata. I had to bring up Wikidata. Um, anyway, we are coming to the end of our time here. Um, what should we say to close? I don't have anything. Oh, I I do need to say I mentioned last week my mustache cup, right? And I said that. Um, a friend of mine gave it to me, and I went home and was uh, telling my wife about how we did this, and it was fun. And she said, I gave you that cup. And so I was like, ah! 
because I have two or three. I couldn't remember who gave who what. So anyway, <laughs> this was given to me by my wife. So I need to clarify that. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know if we solved anything, um, but there's um, some resources in our in our GitHub repo. We'll put more up as we think about them. Uh, this has been fun as always, Sheila. Thank you so much for yes. taking f four weeks to. Uh, just puzzle through this stuff with me. It's been fun. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, listeners, viewers, we'll see you next time. Uh, thanks for coming. Bye-bye.